Good morning, everyone. Good to see y'all. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to uh, introduce our speaker for today. Her name is Dr. Shalon Irvin, and uh, I've, I've known her for probably about 12 or 13 years now. And um, uh, she is a graduate of Spelman College uh, with a degree in psychology. Uh, also, she went to Franklin High School. Franklin High School. I think there's some Frank. I think there's some Franklinites in here somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> and she got a, her PhD from Georgia School of Psychology at Augusta University. So we we're so glad to have her here. She most importantly, she is a, a true believer, follower of Christ, and uh, you you will uh, she she. You will hear it in her voice, and, and she's a, a woman of joy, a woman of peace, and, uh, and she's just a way ahead of her years. She's a wise young, wise young lady. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, here's Dr. Shalon Irvin. I'm always afraid to move mics. <laughs> Can you all hear me? Okay, there we go. I don't want to destruct the scene. <laughs> well, thank you for that introduction. I am Shalon Irvin, delighted to be here with you, and I will be talking about peace. I think it's an important topic, especially during this time, not only during the Advent season, but during this season and season and season of a pandemic, during all of these times that we are in. Um, I was just speaking right before as I was thinking about the Advent season, about how this is supposed to be a season of peace. However, due to commercialism and all of the things, it's become a season of chaos. So sometimes it can be very difficult to find our peace during these times. So this presentation is adapted from the scripture from Isaiah 26.3, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. I think this is important. There's some important components in here I want you to keep in mind. So the mind stayed on thee, as well as trust. Sometimes we want to find peace, and we just think it should come naturally. And our mind is everywhere else but stayed on thee. <laughs> our mind is external. Our mind is, what do I need to do? What do I need to buy? And God is there, but he's there, not here. And then that trust piece. Trust is a hard thing, especially when we can't see what's going to happen next. So trust comes when we can't see, and that can be hard and often brings anxiety because we live in a society that also likes to have control. We have this false sense that we are in control of our lives, we are in control, and when you're not in control, you're doing the wrong thing. But control is often the antithesis of trust, because you can't truly trust and be in control, because that's not really trust. That's, I know what's going to happen next, or I think I know what's going to happen next. But true trust comes from not knowing, but still believing. So I wanted to include this scripture in the season of Advent, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. So we were given the gift in Advent of peace through the life of Christ. And when we think about his life, it was not a walk in the park. <laughs> Christ was our perfect example of how to keep peace in the midst of a storm. He was able to go through all that he went through without sin, which I'm still trying to do. <laughs> and he showed us that through his life. And one thing that we're going to talk about in a few slides is feelings and emotions, because sometimes that can also be the antithesis of our peace. And we don't want to feel them. So how does mental health connect? So I am a clinical psychologist. I work in the mental health field. I currently work for the King County Superior Courts where I am helping the juvenile court become more trauma informed. I also do private practice and consultant work. So one thing that I see a lot of times with mental health of course, the mind, which I just was talking about, but we sometimes want to disconnect the mind from the spirit and from the body. 
And when we think of them as three separate pieces, that's usually when our peace goes away. We want to focus on one part. I often see people who are feeling anxious, and one thing they'll do is, I'm going to go exercise. Well, great, that's the body. What are we going to do about the mind? What are we going to do about the spirit? Because they are all interconnected. So when we think about mental health and mental wellness, I want you to think about it not just about the mind, but all three of those components, because they are interconnected. So when we have a close connection with God, we can experience peace even during a storm. That is the heart of this message. And we're going to discuss some practical tips because I want to make sure that you leave with something, not just my voice in your head. <laughs> so how do we obtain peace? Million dollar question of the day. So peace does not come without practice, just like Faith, that topic we were talking about earlier, faith without works is dead. So think about the two interconnectedly. You're not just going to wake up and have peace. And sometimes we do because that's a special gift from God. But if we want to think about sustained peace, that requires practice. And sometimes that message is not sent to us. Sometimes it's just you should feel at peace at all times. And if you don't, something is wrong with you. You should be happy at all times. I call that toxic positivity. <laughs> happiness is a great thing, and I love to experience it, but I don't know happiness until I know other emotions. And if I don't allow myself to feel those emotions, that creates more anxiety when I don't feel happy. So I want you to think about your relationship with happiness and your relationship with peace, because all of this is about relationships. Christ came and showed us about relationships, and we are supposed to have a relationship with him. But sometimes that relationship with him, because he gave us the Holy Spirit as well, which dwells in us, starts with our relationship with ourselves. We often look to the external to find our peace. I love to shop, so sometimes I, I have to catch myself when I'm feeling anxious. I'm like, put down the Amazon app on your phone and figure out what's going on. Or we keep ourselves busy sometimes, and that's where we find peace because we connect peace with success. But peace is really inside, and if you find yourself looking for your peace externally, that is a great indication that it's time to go inward. Because you were given the gift that Christ gave us. So first, you know, in the early Testament, we had God walking the earth. But God never left us. He then sent his son. And when Jesus departed the earth, he sent the Holy Spirit. So we are imparted with all that we need, but sometimes it doesn't feel like enough because it's not tangible and it's not what society tells us brings us peace. So peace does not equate a life with no problems. Sorry to burst everybody's bubble, <laughs> even my own. <laughs> God did not promise us a life without problems. And when we equate peace with a life without problems, we set ourselves up for disaster. Sometimes we are in perfect peace when life is going like we predict. Life is going like we've planned out. Our schedules flow. There's no interruptions. And then that one interruption comes. Maybe you missed a stoplight. And that peace immediately fades, and we feel anxiety, we feel anger, we feel all types of emotions. But what I want you to leave with today is that we want to work on finding peace in the midst of a storm. Because sometimes we have this fairy tale that peace means there's no storms. Peace means everything is calm like that picture in the beginning where the ocean was just still and our lives were still. But what happens when the ocean is rocking? I often think about the scripture where Jesus was asleep on the boat and we're in the midst of a storm. Everyone else is looking around. I imagine like, what is he doing? Can't he stop these waves? But that's where, once again, that trust comes. And I use that as a metaphor for our lives. Sometimes we are in that boat. Sometimes it feels like the storm is never going to end and we just want it to stop. And God is saying, go inward. If you trust me, even in this storm, you know that I have you. And that is a hard lesson for all of us, but it's something of why we have to keep going back to the scripture, why we have to keep having fellowship, because those reminders can be snatched away very quickly if we don't stay in it. So what keeps us from peace? I want you all um, to think about personally, just for a few seconds, about things in your personal life that keep you from peace. Because we can talk about things that don't relate, but I want you to Go internal and think about things that take away your peace. Just 
So some things, of course, that come to mind are problems, difficulties, worries, and fears. They can snatch that peace right away. And finding peace, of course, I'm talking about it like it's so easy. It's easier said than done because we have to work. There's job stresses. There's home stress when you come home from work or even those who are working from home or even not working from home because I even consider people who are at home all day. That's work too. <laughs> work does not leave us. Financial stressors, especially as we think about this season of inflation. I was just reading an article that said, with the rate of inflation that we're at now, you're technically working one month for free compared to last year. That didn't sit well with me, but <laughs> once again, I had to find peace in what I can't control. We have family stress. We have health stress. And our thoughts and our expectations are often a stress. So there is a relationship between peace and our thoughts and our expectations. Expectations are a great thing. I used to think if I don't have expectations, I won't be disappointed. Well, I lied to myself. <laughs> I'm human, I'm gonna have expectations, and if I don't, I'm cheating myself. However, how connected I am to those expectations and how I impose those expectations on others can be problematic. Sometimes I think, well, if I can do it, you can do it too. Nope, everybody's wired a little differently, and that expectation set me up for a life of no peace when I was living like that. Because I was expecting, okay, I'm on time, you should be on time too. Not everybody likes time. <laughs> so, so sometimes we have to have some flexibility. So in order to have peace, we have to be flexible. So the greatest obstacles to our inner peace are disturbing emotions, such as anger and attachment, Fear, suspicion, while love and compassion and a sense of universal responsibility are the sources of peace and happiness. Now, why am I talking about emotions? <laughs> of course, because I'm a clinical psychologist and I love them, but I also think emotions play a part in our day. But oftentimes, we are taught that there are good emotions and then there are bad emotions. However, I don't believe that. I believe all emotions are good. All emotions were given to us by God. Once again, if we go back to the Bible and we think of the story of Jesus, he felt anger, he felt sadness, he felt intense distress, he also felt happiness, he felt the gamut of emotions. And in his life, it showed us how to handle those, once again, without sin, which we all need to master. So <laughs> I don't believe that emotions are bad, where we have this good and bad, it comes from how we express those emotions. So I may feel anger, but if I go and I yell at everyone and say nasty words, that's when that becomes bad. Not the feeling itself, but the expression of it. I may feel sadness, and that's okay. But if my relationship with sadness is I shouldn't feel it, it's going to cause a turmoil in me and actually create more sadness. I may feel anxiety. I may feel panic, but my relationship with control impacts whether I have peace or not. So it's not the emotion itself, it's our relationship and our expression of it that take away our peace and our joy. So what we want to think about as we go back to that mental list of what are the barriers to your peace? What are the expressions that come with those barriers? Because usually that is what's keeping you from the peace. It's not the feeling, it's the expression, and it's our relationship with it. And society doesn't help us. Once again, going back to that toxic positivity, you shouldn't feel that. Well, yes, you should. Because emotions are our guide and our feelers, and they connect with our core beliefs. So if we disconnect from our emotions, we're disconnecting with our core beliefs, which then in turn causes us to disconnect from the Holy Spirit. Because our beliefs are strong, and if we allow external things to tell us what we should believe, I think about every hour our beliefs would change. Whenever I turn the news on, depending on what channel I'm watching or what I'm reading, if I just go by what they're saying, I will not have a belief. Because one minute it's this, the next second it's this, it's someone else's opinion. And if I allow that to flood what I believe, I will be lost, I will be without peace, and I'll be fluttering in the wind. So what I want to challenge everybody to do, and this isn't a one-day task, this is a lifelong task, is recognize your relationship with your emotions. 
recognize that relationship with your peace or maybe your lack thereof. I know that that is a lot. So <laughs> emotions really are just psychological states and they let us know. So one thing you also have to do is recognize what your core beliefs are and what your values are in the absence of others, in the absence of news, in that stillness and in that quiet. And that's why sometimes we equate peace with quiet. But how can you obtain peace when there's noise all around you? Sometimes that means disconnecting. Sometimes that means shutting off so that you can connect back to your source of power. I know I'm on my cell phone quite a lot because <laughs> it's just, it guides me through life. But when I become too dependent on my cell phone, like yesterday when I left it at Fred Meyer, <laughs> luckily, <laughs> luckily I found it and I, I kind of chuckled because I, I went into a panic. I was at the gas station. I said, wait a minute, I don't have my phone. And I said, well, if somebody took that phone, they're going to be in for a surprise because I have a scripture on the back of my phone. <laughs> and that scripture talks about, um, for God is with you. I mean, for God is with me and I should not fear anything. And I said, well, maybe somebody needs that scripture. But luckily I found it 30 minutes later. But that was a moment when I felt anxious. I felt like my peace was stolen. I felt like my whole day was going to be ruined. I felt like, oh my gosh, no one can call me. Then I thought, hmm, that might not be a bad thing. <laughs> so, but I'm using the cell phone example because every day, sometimes multiple times a day, depending on how much I utilize it, I have to plug it back in. I have to plug it back into its source of power so it can be recharged. Sometimes we lack peace because we're not recharging. We are on a battery of 10%, which causes on my phone my light to dim, so I have to look even harder to look. So sometimes that causes our own internal lights to dim. A lot of us are walking around on 10% battery. And as we think about Advent and as we light the candles, I think we're on week three, time is going by so fast. Um, Think about that, that is the light that shines, but if we are constantly on a 10% battery, that light can't shine. And that is when the enemy comes in and steals not only your peace, but the peace around, because peace is like energy, it's transferred. You can often feel people's energy, whether you wanna acknowledge it or not. That energy is very strong. So sometimes in order to obtain peace, you also have to recognize who's around you. Who's helping you? Who's uplifting you and gravitating to those energies? Now, I say that with caution because sometimes, like in clinical practice, I've said that and people have gotten a list of who they're going to cut off. <laughs> These people are no longer helpful to my life. But then we're missing out a portion, a portion of we are all supposed to give our light to others. And I know I went through that personally in life. I was like, I'm going to just not deal with anybody who doesn't bring me happiness. <laughs> but then I was surrounded by a lot of light, but my light wasn't shining because there's so much light around, which is good sometimes. Like being in rooms like this, I can feel your energy. It feels great, but I'm supposed to recharge on that energy to be able to spread that joy to other people who may not know it. And that is why sometimes peace can be a hard balance, and life is about balance. And balancing means being aware of where you are, whose you are, and what your call to purpose in life is. Sometimes we can move away from that purpose, like the picture in the beginning. I would love to be on the beach all the time. <laughs> I would love not to work some days, but is that my purpose? Is that my calling? And when we move away from that, even in a peaceful environment, you won't feel internal peace because that core belief, that voice will speak to say there's more to your life than this. And sometimes that means dealing with unbelievers. Sometimes that means dealing with people who are having a rough day and recognizing that that's not a reflection of you. That's a reflection of their own internal battle. So not personalizing that because we often take things offensively. I know I do, I'm very sensitive. <laughs> but I've had to practice recognizing that sometimes what I'm feeling is an internal piece and I'm just using the outside as a blank canvas or a mirror. So even when I'm having those moments where I am not my best, when I'm going back to recharge, I reflect on those moments. And reflection is an important part of maintaining your peace because if you don't have that still time to reflect, 
You're going to be the Energizer Bunny. You're going to keep going and going and going, but you're going to get further and further away from your destination. So this is why I've included emotions, because I think they're very important, and I think they are our guides, and when we ignore them, we move further away from peace, even though sometimes we're told, ignore them so you can have peace. That's temporary. And avoidance is only supposed to be a temporary solution because sometimes you have to avoid. I know there's moments when I'm like, my battery's on 5%. If I don't avoid people, I may be led to sin. <laughs> so it's having that recognition of, okay, I'm going to back up for not only my own well-being, but everybody else's well-being. So that's temporary avoidance so that you can recharge and go back. When you do it for long periods of time, it becomes detrimental. So here are some practical takeaways. Quiet your mind. That can be a hard task, especially with noise all around us, with demands all around you, with family needing things, with other people needing things, with a task list so long that you probably don't even want to look at it some days. But quieting your mind means even when your mind is moving quickly, sitting there with it. Connecting. This is going to be a controversial statement, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> Peace is really about being comfortable in your discomfort. It's about recognizing that I am uncomfortable, this is uncomfortable, but I'm not going to run from it. I'm going to recognize why I'm uncomfortable. And a lot of times when we feel uncomfortable, we just want to jump to comfort things. I love comfort food. So <laughs> I want to jump to comfort food. It makes me feel better, and then I can remove myself from that feeling. But the problem with that is feelings don't go away. That feeling will pop up again later after that comfort food is digested. Then I'll have to have more, <laughs> which won't help my physical health and won't help the other pieces. So peace is really about comfort in your discomfort. Being okay with discomfort, recognizing that discomfort often promotes change and it promotes growth. And we all want growth, but we usually don't want the work that comes along with it. <laughs> like, yes, I want to grow, but ooh, that's hard. <laughs> so that is where the discomfort becomes so important. Acknowledging your emotions, but not aligning with them. So an example would be, I'm angry right now, but I'm not an angry person. I'm sad right now, but that doesn't make me depressed necessarily. And a whole other topic, but I have to say it because depression just came up. Depression isn't always a bad thing either. Sometimes it's a force that causes us to go back to that quiet time. Because we all have moments of depression in life. If you've lived long enough or even short enough, you're going to feel it because life has pain. And pain, depression is often a byproduct of pain. So when we recognize what that is trying to tell us, that's getting comfortable with the discomfort. Get into the word. Sometimes that can be hard to do, and sometimes we get so busy we neglect it. But I recognize every time I neglect it, my peace is taken away, and then I'm angry and mad, when in reality, it was right there the whole time. Mindfulness or prayer, I like prayer, but. Mindfulness and prayer are often one and the same. So sometimes you'll hear people talk about mindfulness. I think about it as stillness and prayer. And prayer is not just talking to God. It's also giving time for God to talk to you. And sometimes we get so busy in our requests to God that we can't even hear the answer. And then we say, God's not talking to me. <laughs> Did you give him time? Maybe he told you. Maybe the answer is wait. I don't like to wait either, working on that. <laughs> Patience is a virtue that I'm working on. <laughs> Emotional guidance and therapy. I think therapy is a powerful tool. I think there's a stigma with it, and that's what I work daily is to fight that stigma. Therapy is just having a sounding board of someone to help guide you. It's not a coach, it's a guide. And why I make that difference is I think of it like Siri on your iPhone. So a good therapist shouldn't be saying, you have to be here in one hour. A good therapist would say, I see this is where you want to go. The fastest route is right, but if you turn left, we're going to reroute and allow you to explore that. So just having an external source to help you with your spirituality is also a good thing. And sometimes the emotional guide might be within the church. 
We know we have great pastors who also serve in that role as well. <laughs> so there's various avenues you can take, but I think it's good to have that. Alter your relationship and understanding of peace, which we've talked a lot about. And then practice, 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 and perseverance. Because that's that perseverance piece that can be hard. I also want you to recognize that it's not the destination, it's the journey. Peace of mind is not an end-all, be-all. It's a constant journey that will, you'll be tested. And the more you find peace, the more you'll be tested to move to that next level because there is no end point to it. And sometimes our relationship with, okay, if I just get here, I'll be okay. If I just win the lottery, I'll be okay. <laughs> but that, if you don't have peace, you don't have it. That's why a lot of people who win the lottery, which I never understood, end up bankrupt. I'm like, how? But it's about the relationship. It's about the relationship with the money. Money can also be a distractor of peace. So although we're taught to love it, now I understand why it was called the root of all evil before. I was like, no, it'll help you find peace. It'll help you get connected. But the older I get, the more I understand. It's about the relationship with it. Because things are tools. And if we use them as tools, great. But if we use them as this will save me, we have disconnected from God. We've disconnected from our Savior. And usually you'll then soon disconnect by force from whatever you're relying on. <laughs> so here are some scriptures that I find helpful when I am in the midst of a storm. So I often go to Philippians 4, 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is loving or lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about those things. So this circles back to the mind. Sometimes we move away from what our, we should be thinking about, but then we expect to have peace, not possible. So I often go back to Philippians, and this doesn't mean you won't feel anxious. This means how are you connecting with that anxiety? Are you saying I'm having a moment of anxiety or I'm an anxious person? Two different things. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. And I love this piece about how the world gives. The world gives us tangible material things. The world gives us fleeting things. But that's often what we gravitate to for peace. So going back to the scripture and remembering I have everything that I need. I just may not be tapped into it. Romans 5.1 Therefore, being justified by faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So here comes that word faith again that we talked about in the beginning. That faith, that belief that no matter what, as long as I keep God first, I'm going to be okay, even when my surroundings tell me otherwise. Romans 8, 6. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So that goes back to that flesh, and the flesh often gets us in trouble. But the flesh is what we're taught. Through faith, we become spiritually minded. Through practice, we become spiritually minded. Through fellowship, we become spiritually minded. This is what we need to gravitate towards. So in this season of Advent, in this season of Christmas, think about why we are here. Think about the reason for this season. The true reason, the gifts are nice, the gifts do connect us, but they're supposed to be tools of expression of love. They're not supposed to be the love. So when you find yourself gravitating in this hustle and bustle of the season, but Christ is lacking, you won't have peace. It'll be stolen. And then in January, you'll be paying for it <laughs> if you're using credit. <laughs> and even if you're not using credit, your balance won't look as happy as it did before you started shopping. So think about what gifts you're giving 
and what they represent and what messages you're sending people when giving those gifts. Are they Christ-centered? Are they tools? Or are you using them to gain the love? Because you won't find the peace there. And you won't pass that message on. That light will be dim. That light will be at 10%. And that's not what we want. So now I'd like to open the floor if you have any questions, any comments, anything to say, because I know I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> This, this is free to share, so I have emailed it, and I want all to have it, because I know trying to remember it is going to be pretty hard. <laughs> so do I. I love lists, but then sometimes I become too reliant, like I was yesterday. Left my whole phone. So <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, that is a hard concept to understand. Because emotions take over. Emotions are the opposite of logic oftentimes, and that's why people don't want to feel them. Because they're stored in a different part of your brain than your logical cerebral part of the brain. So a lot of us like to be in logic because logic usually equates to control. Logic equates to success. Logic means that I can get this done. But when our emotions come in, they're like a volcano. Here I am, and you're going to fill me. <laughs> and if you're not going to fill me, I've got something else for you. That's called somatization. And somatization is when your body starts feeling it. So that's also something to look out for, and something I often work with my clients with is, OK, think about that lump in your throat when you don't want to cry. It hurts until you have to. Oftentimes, if we think about indigestion, some of our heart problems, there's an emotional connection to them which then is connected to our mind and our thoughts. So when we don't align with our emotions, we are saying, this is what I'm feeling, and I'm feeling this in relation to my external environment. There's something externally that goes against what I thought should happen, or what I thought um, didn't happen and I wanted it to happen. So it's not the alignment of, this is who I am, but it's, okay, something is going on. I'm feeling this. What is this feeling telling me? Sitting back thinking about that feeling when you do have time, because sometimes in the moment you don't have time. But don't run from it. Go back during that recharge period, which is essential. Because once you start aligning with that, you start becoming it. And because emotions are the opposite of logic, you will be a very illogical person, like a child. <laughs> One thing I love about children is usually they are who they are. Their emotions come out when they come out. They're then socialized to learn, don't cry here, don't do this, don't say that. But they're the purest form of feeling. A baby doesn't come in and say, church is going on, I'm not going to cry until. <laughs> it cries and doesn't care who it disrupts. Get me what I need. But we learn through life that sometimes we have to balance and there's a time and a place. But if we don't make time and place, we then become aligned with the emotion because it takes over until we deal with it or our bodies deal with it. So that's why it's so important to recognize it, but recognize that it's fleeting and it may change. I may be happy in five minutes. I may be sad in another five minutes. But recognizing that that is part of the process and not just tying ourselves to one emotion, such as happiness. Yes? You work uh, in for the courts? Yes. So talk about peace in the midst of injustice. That is such a difficult topic. And that is also why another side job I have, I work with Equity Matters Northwest, which looks at systems and looks at how systems bring in justice and how sometimes it's the environment, not the individual. Sometimes we label the individual. That's an angry person or that person is acting out when they're, it's a natural response to the injustice or their environment. And that can be a double message we send to people of feel, but then when you feel, you're punished for feeling, and you're punished for doing something that goes against societal norms, when in actuality it goes with your core beliefs. So that is one thing I do a lot of trainings within the court to get people to recognize, don't look at just the behavior, look at the root of it. What caused it? And by doing punishment, because punishment sometimes has to happen, what message are you sending? 
Are you sending the message of stay within this injustice and don't respond, pretend you're happy with it? Or are you sending the message that your expression of that feeling was improper and this is what you're paying retribution for? But let's explore more of that feeling and here are some resources to do so, so that you can do it in a healthy way. So that's what a lot of my work in the court looks like. It's saying, okay, here's some resources. We recognize that the behavior was not good and we wanna acknowledge that and we want to acknowledge the why. Because if not, we have great recidivism in the court and we have people, repeat offenders coming back and we're saying, well, why are they still committing crimes? Well, what have we changed? Are you getting a good response? Uh, people to, um, to Begrudgingly, but, <laughs> but that's where my perseverance and practice continues to come. I don't expect change to be easy, and a lot of times systems have been what they are, and sometimes systems don't want to be broken, but that does not mean be silent. <laughs> so sometimes work is stressful. Yes. <laughs> Guilt is a very strong emotion, and guilt usually comes from other unchecked emotions. So sometimes if your relationship, it goes back to the relationship with the emotion, if you feel like you shouldn't be happy because maybe circumstances aren't what they should be or other people aren't happy, that guilt can come in. But guilt is supposed to be a temporary thing. So for example, I'll go back to ice cream. <laughs> so if I'm on a diet and I eat some ice cream, I won't say how much. Um, that guilt is supposed to kick in to tell me, hey, you're moving away from what you said you wanted to do. But if I feel prolonged guilt and a week later I'm still feeling that guilt, that doesn't allow me to change my behavior. So if you are feeling guilty for being happy, you want to recognize why you don't feel maybe that you're worthy to be happy. Why don't you feel that you should have that feeling? So it's really connecting to the relationship you have, less about the feeling. So what message was sent to me to say I shouldn't feel this? And maybe sometimes even it can be very hard to feel happiness when others around you aren't happy, but that's that light again coming in saying, I need to be this light to normalize that happiness is okay even when we don't have everything we want. Because we have what we need, we just may not have it in the way we think we should have it. Great question. I know we're coming up on time, so are there any other questions anyone has? <laughs> I would, you know, this is my joy, like, so <laughs> sometimes, like, my family's like, here she comes again, talking about those emotions, <laughs> but I keep doing it because it's my joy and I think it's important. This will also include my contact information. I'm open for any questions people do have, because like I said, it's my joy. I feel blessed to be able to be able to do this, and I don't want to hoard the resources. What, what triggered you to, to go this direction in your life? That's another great question. So I always thought I was going to either be a medical doctor or a psychiatrist. And my first semester of college, my dear aunt who was like a second mother to me because I came from a close-knit family she passed away and I didn't know what to do with myself I'm 3,000 miles away from family I was in a psychology course at the time and funny story I my mom said you need to go to therapy and I'm like I'm not going to therapy like <laughs> so she forced me to go and in that session I had the therapist talking about herself I totally diverted from me because I had a test and I was like, I don't have time for these emotions. And I said, hmm, maybe there's something to this. Started taking more psychology courses and I loved it. So I think that therapist, even though I wouldn't open up to her, it did help show me that maybe you have a skill set that you didn't know you had. <laughs> and then I'm also a daughter of a Vietnam veteran who has PTSD. And going through the course of my studies, it better helped me understand what he was going through, which I didn't know because PTSD is a disorder of secrecy and control. So I did not know he was going through it and he 
progressed well in life for a, a veteran, whatever that may mean. But it was later in life when he retired that some of the symptoms came out, but I had education to understand. And that is why when I first got out of grad school, I worked for the VA in an intensive PTSD unit, which I loved. Like, it was life-fulfilling work. And I still do work with um, the Veterans Training Support Center. So that's what led me to where I am now. I didn't go by what I thought I would do. I let the Holy Spirit guide me, even though at the time I didn't know that's what was happening. <laughs> well, thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, well, a few points of good news. One is that um, this was recorded and will be available. I, I forgot to bring a pen and paper, and there were so many nuggets that I was like, okay, it's recorded. We can go back and watch it. So um, that's wonderful news. If you would like this PowerPoint, if you would send me an email, susannah at upc.org, or just write down your email and hand that to me before you leave, and I will email, share this um, PowerPoint with you. So I, I would love to pray for your ministry, really, your ministry and what you're doing. Um, so as I pray to close our time, we're going to do that as well. God, thank you that you, um, I, I guess I'm overwhelmed by your goodness to us, that you do give us even the gift of a range of emotions, that you let us feel that you, Jesus, who we're, uh, we're celebrating the reality that you came um, and moved into our neighborhood and took on flesh and that you experienced emotion. That is such a gift to me to know that you and I relate in that way and that you, um, you invite me to think about my feelings and to discover more of you, discover more of your love, discover more of the work that you want to do in my life and all of our lives through what we feel. So we're so grateful for all that you, Holy Spirit, brought to us this morning through Dr. Irvin, and we do pray for her ministry. God, we know it is such important work that you've called her to do. It's important, it's powerful, it's hard, it's heavy, it's healing, it's all of these things. We ask that you would bless her, that you would bless her um, with a an ability to recharge, that you would pour out your presence on her, uh, that you would give her your peace, your wisdom, your love, your presence, all of the things that we know that she needs each and every day. We also pray that you give her favor. We pray that you would light a clear path before her, that she would able to be continue to do really uh, work that brings about change within the justice system, caring for these juveniles. We pray that. Lord, I pray for each of my, my friends, brothers, and sisters here, that we, we come to this space desiring to live more fully into your peace so that we might extend your peace to everybody that we encounter. So Holy Spirit, do that work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks for coming, you all. <laughs>